Hey everybody, um, it's Thursday night. My name's James. This is the first of a, I don't know, a, a new Thursday night review stream um, on Living for Crits. As you can see, there's my, my counterpart is not here, mainly because she's not that great with, I don't know, book, book work and homework assignments. And, uh, you know, I don't, there's not that many modules that she's read cover to cover. And I didn't want this to be one of those experiences that I recorded with her next to me and she didn't talk, you know. So I thought that these would be something we would try to do sort of in the middle of the week. And over the last couple of weeks, at least on YouTube, you may have seen – my sleeves are messed up. You may have seen that uh, I've been filming – these YouTube videos of like the, the 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 Walls Dungeon Tavern. I did the video of uh, shirt is just not working with me today. I did it. I did a video of just how the our basement is set up because I'm very proud of this room. And I did a video of the Dwarven Forge set up. So both of those were fun to do. We thought I thought this week I would try to do something more organized, not just a on the fly. Uh, upload of a video but instead have there be a live stream and if folks want to come and chat about products or whatever I'm reviewing they can uh, no one on there right now because this is not the regular night of the week but the goal will be that at nine o'clock on Thursdays I will be on talking about some kind of product I have a few rules I'm gonna try to follow it has to be something that I own something that I've read uh, preferably something that I've run if it's an adventure, and I'm gonna be open to suggestions. Uh, I, I've shared before this over here, Up Down Devon is on. What is Up Devon? I've shared that this is, the, this is the collection of stuff I have now. So there is obviously enough here for at least a year of reviews. Although I have to say, I'm probably gonna be partial to Dungeon Crawl Classics reviews because sort of my my game of choice, typically, uh, with my dabbling in Shadow of the Demon Lord lately being something I've been I've been trying. Um, so anyway, so this is going to be a definitely a very Goodman Games heavy kind of review process, but that's okay because I noticed in the last couple of streams that I've done, people have asked for reviews, especially about Lankmar, and I thought we'd start out with what is probably I gotta be careful this this is flashy and shiny. One of my favorite game products to come out in recent years, if not my favorite RPG product that I've kickstarted, um, I'm trying to decide if it's ever. It's definitely high up there. I don't want to say ever because it's like trying to pick your favorite child or your favorite movie or your favorite album. That can be really hard. At least it is for me. I think my favorite album is uh, is. I mean, to be honest, is is probably. I can't do it. I can't do album. I can't do album. I can't do adventure modules or adventure pro or uh, Kickstarter products. But we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about this one today. So this is the DCC Lankmar box set. It is a. It is deceptively heavy. I can't even close the damn thing anymore, which I don't want to close it too much. I don't want to crush anything that's in there. It has been unboxed. This is not. This is an unboxing video where I've already unboxed it once. But uh, I thought what I would do is talk a bit about how, for, for tonight, talk a bit about the, about, the, about the product itself, why it piqued my interest, what's inside the box, if you get this, if you have no idea what's inside DCC Lankmar, and then what I really liked about it, especially with the differences from core DCC, maybe some compare and contrast to uh, the, the Savage Worlds Lankmar, and most importantly, what who is this good for? And I think that's what I'm going to try to do with every review that I do, is, is who is this product really designed for? Is it something that's for your players? Is it something for, obviously, is it for the judge if it's an adventure, but what judges will like or DMs or GMs, whatever term you use, referees. i got to remember it's not always DCC folk on here. What what kind of adventure is it? Because you have your adventures that are crazy off the wall Gonzo, like anything that involves a grim tooth, or a lot of the purple planet is very Gonzo, and you have your stuff that's a little more 
I don't know. Uh, I don't want to say mainstream DCC. Like I would say that there's a little less of the Gonzo in the Chain Coffin box set, which is also by Michael Curtis, who did DCC. Lankmar was the lead writer on that. But there's definitely some. There's definitely weird in in, in the Chain Coffin. Uh, DCC Lankmar takes things at a, bif- at a different level. So if you're a DCC fan, if you love Dungeon Crawl Classics. I think you're going to get a very different experience with DCC Lankmar compared to what you get now with what is out there already. Even some of the stuff that points at Punjar, which is one of the um, cities, I believe, in Aerith, the sort of home campaign setting of uh, of the what's it called of uh, of Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, in the original modules, the the older modules that came out during the third edition days. I know Punjar is somewhere that uh, Harley Stroh has set quite a bit of uh, adventuring around, as has Doug Kovacs. If you ever do anything that involves uh, Doug Con or DCC After Hours at Gen Con, Punjar is discussed. But uh, I believe it's supposed to be sort of a, a take on Lankmar before they had the license. Well, DCC Lankmar just kicks everything up a notch uh, in, in the best possible way. So I was first introduced to this Kickstarter for this at you know GaryCon 2019. We were all, my wife and I were in the audience for What's New with Goodman Games, and they announced that they were starting the Kickstarter in in the room that night or that day, and it would start right then and there. And they invited everyone in the audience to back the Kickstarter, and I got my iPhone out and I backed the Kickstarter before I walked out. And then I realized, I don't know that much about Lankmar. I had read some of the short stories, uh, Swords and Deviltry, I had that collection. So the first Lankmar book, it's a, it's a series of short stories. I'd read through all of them. I thought it was fun. It was enjoyable. Didn't feel like I was a, you know, Lankmar, I don't know, aficionado isn't quite the right word. I really enjoyed them. It was, I liked Fafford and the Grey Mouser. Compared to Conan the Barbarian, which I love a lot of the Robert E. Howard stuff, Fafford as a, as a barbarian, as, as from the from the 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 the, the, the north, from the, the cold wastes or whatnot, he felt like a multi-dimensional character with flaws, whereas Conan just kills everything. So I thought that Fafford was a great character. Grey Mouse is a great character. Uh, since then, I have gotten. Quite a more, quite more bit into into Lankmar in general. I read uh, the next two short story collections. I have the comic book, the graphic novel that Mike Mignolo did, uh, and I've you know really uh, uh, delved further into Lankmar. And and part of that was because I got I backed this Kickstarter, just like I expect to back Dying Earth. I've never read any Dying Earth stuff. Nothing by uh, by Jack Vance. But I did order some of that off of Amazon. Being that it's not essential, I'm not sure where I'm going to get that. But at a glance, DCC Lankmar, and I guess if I was more of a high tech person, I would have like a a, bo- like a window off to the side that shows this electronically. And I'm just not. Uh, this was written primarily by Michael Curtis, and uh, I would say this could be his magnum opus. I'm sure he's going to be continue to write awesome stuff. But and the Chain Coffin was hard to top. But this is just friggin' epic. The cover and much of the art is by Doug Kovacs, but inside you'll find some Janelle Jackways, some Brad McDevitt. Um, I'm, I'm missing someone. Who did I miss? Crap. I'll unbox. Well, let, me, let me make sure I not credit somebody. And some, yeah, Janelle Jackways, Doug Kovacs, and Brad McDevitt. Okay, that was Hall. I didn't miss anybody. I wrote Janelle Jackways on my show notes twice. So I don't know if that has to do with how much art is by uh, Janelle or not. Probably not. Just, I just. You know, my show notes are messy. I picked this for tonight as my first of these Thursday reviews. Partially because I figured there wouldn't be a lot of people watching this live. So I just announced it this week. And I will be reliant on talking. Although if you're watching live, feel free to throw any comments in that you want to throw. Uh, but I this will give me a chance to lecture, I guess, in this instance. But also is that I adore this game. I, I, I love it. And I think that this game, and I have to call it its own thing. I think DCC Lankmar is as much its own thing as, as Mutant Crawl Classics is compared to DCC. It, it changes the classes so much. It changes the play style so much. It's a different game. But I don't mean it in a way that, it, in the same way that if you picked up, I believe, Dark Sun 
for AD and D Second Edition and had been playing Dark Sun, but then a year later was playing Planescape. The basic mechanics are the same for each, but it's a whole different feel. And even though Lankmar is Appendix N uh, literature, uh, and as and all of DCC was based on Appendix N literature as sort of the core. Uh, you know, uh, inspiration for Joe Goodman when he was writing it, Lankmar just cranks it. And and I'm going to go through why. We're going to discuss what's in the box, go through the differences between this and, and, and core DCC, why it makes it different, and we're going to get into all that stuff. This is probably an overly long video, and I'm sorry. I did make hot tea to keep my throat going, though. One thing I should say, as a fan of DCC, and also I, I, as, as, a, as, a, as a Savage Worlds uh, aficionado as well, I've been asked quite a few times to compare Savage Worlds Lankmar to DCC Lankmar. And I do own everything from both. I have all of the DCC Lankmar adventures that are out and published so far. The Rats of Iltamar, I've ordered that. That should be coming soon. And then I have the, the, the Savage Worlds Lankmar box set, along with there was a uh, there was one for like like Adventures in the High Seas for I don't know what it was called, but there was another another uh, small Kickstarter for Savage Worlds Lankmar I backed. And what's the difference between the two? <clears throat> and I think a core difference besides the fact that DCC and La and Savage Worlds are such different games, you have a class base DCC, you have a class based system. That really does have its roots in third edition and 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 old school D and D. Not to say third edition is old school, but you know, in third edition D and D plus basic D and D. That's where you know the the roots are for 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 DCC. And Savage Worlds is a non class system that's really designed for pulpy uh, action adventure uh, uh, experiences. The the main difference is I think there's two. The first is that DCC Lankamar blends everything about uh, Lankmar into DCC and it's interwoven. So there's things that are very different in a DCC Lankmar campaign compared to regular DCC. And I think in, in Savage Worlds Lankmar, while it's very well written, uh, there's not as much material. It's, 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 uh, it comes in, I think, a couple, uh, two or three 96 page uh, graphic novel size uh, documents. Uh, that so there, there's not as much material in there compared to the books you get with DCC, and then it still feels a bit like you're playing uh, Savage Worlds with, with with like a Lankmar skin bolted on. It doesn't feel as woven together as as the DCC experience does. And they both had a license from the Fritz Library Estate to do the game, but the DCC just their take on it is something for long term play. Uh, I, I've been able to mix the Savage Worlds Lankmar pretty easily with other fantasy stuff. I, I've used it and run some Saga of the Goblin Horde for Savage Worlds and ran it into Lankmar just for, you know, for fun. But uh, it, it tonally, I, I don't feel like it's as, it's as um, it doesn't strike the chord as well as the DCC version does. Uh, they're both great. They're both uh, uh, phenomenal games. If you are a Savage Worlds fan, definitely get the box set. For, for Savage Worlds, but I would say get the DCC box set too. There's a lot in here you're gonna find that's gonna fit your game. So uh, this is not the truest unboxing because I've been playing this for about a year now, if not longer. I've had one short-lived online campaign where we played through Mass of Lankmar and I have an in-person now online campaign because of coronavirus that still continues in uh, the the that game, where play, we played the Madhouse meet, which I did with Dwarven Forge. It was great. Uh, and then we played No Small Crimes in Lankmar, which comes in this box set. And an adventure called All These Mingles um, that I wrote based on the carousing tables. Um, and, you know, the carousing tables is something that's so core to to DCC compared... Uh, DCC Lankmar compared to... I'm sorry about the ringer there. Compared to... Uh, uh, you know, traditional DCC. The carousing tables are awesome. I'll discuss those in a second. And uh, I also was a judge at the DCC tournament last year at Gen Con and had the pleasure of running the Greatest Thieves in Lankmar. And I gotta say, if you back that, you are in for a major treat. All right, we've got, we've got, uh, our stock though is saying there is some really interesting discussion fodder on just how, on how much different systems directly support a setting versus just reskin to play 
within uh, within a setting. And I, I hardly agree. I think uh, I, I think that this is something where uh, this is something where the, where where DCC is definitely uh, uh, stitched in. Lankmar is stitched into the DCC version, whereas I think it's like I said it's bolted on to Savage Worlds, and it's it's a it's. It's, it's good material. I, I, I don't want to talk down to it at all. I don't want to have it come across that way. But I do want to... I mean, I have a obvious preference of what I think was was truer to the, the works of, of, the, of Fritz Leiber. Um, all right. So with that said, let's open the box. It It is deceptively small, but it's not... So I think it's the same size of the Purple Planet and Chain Coffin box sets, but... Once you take the wrapping off, it bulges up a bit. It is a heavy, heavy box. It retails for fifty nine ninety nine. Like all Goodman Games products, I believe this comes with a PDF now. If you go online and get it from Goodman Games, there's a PDF attached to it. So you get the electronic version. And for right now, for online gaming, it's probably an important thing. So you could like screen share maps and stuff. And uh, the art on the cover, the, 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 uh, the art by... Doug Kovacs is top notch, and it has a great feel to it. You know they're escaping something. This wizard up here, you know he's causing some trouble. You know this woman down here, she's gonna cause some trouble. I mean it's it's it just feels fun when you look at the cover of this, which is what this should be. This should be a fun campaign. I love the glitteriness of the font. I don't know why they did that. All the adventures that came in the Kickstarter though, because if you kickstarted this, you got like six or seven adventure modules with it on top of the box, not included in the box. Um, and, you know, with that said, uh, they all have the glitteriness here. All right, Devin's asking, can you play DCC Lankmar without DCC Core? And would you recommend it as a starting place for DCC or is it more expert level? Those are two fantastic questions. No, you can't play it without DCC Core. You're going to need to have... This is Judge Evie's book, but you're going to need to have one of the Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, core books to play this. You don't have to have, and, and, and all the covers are different, so don't, you may not have this cover. My other ones are over there. This is uh, the Jeff Easley cover, but whatever DCC core book you have, the main core book, that's what you'll need to run it. But a lot that's in here has changed, which I'm going to go into. I also wouldn't say that it's more of an expert level. It's different. It it's going to play differently. And I think if you are a seasoned role player of any system, I think that you'll have no problem running DCC Lankmore. I would I would definitely not say it's for expert play. It, it, it's different, and it's going to have a different feel, more of an action-adventure feel, kind of. I don't want to say like Savage Worlds, but it's going to have more of a heroic feel. You don't have that your fodder feel. Like in DCC, you start out as fodder. You don't feel that way in Lankmar. Unless you roll really bad and your and your judge is mean. Um, so so opening this up, the first book you're gonna have is the Compendium of Secret Knowledge. This is a 40-page document. In the covers, there are uh, NPC or player images. I think Doug did the work for these. I believe these are Doug Kovacs. Um, there are some cutouts. Well, I wouldn't cut these out, but you can photocopy these. These are luck tokens. I'll get into fleeting luck in a second. Uh, but you have more of these NPCs in the back. You have a random name generator, a hundred random Naewanian names in the back. Flipping through this, this book covers pretty much all the basics that you need for character generation. Determining place of origin for your character. Like your character is going to be from one of the lands of Nawan, whether he, uh, he or she is a mingle, whether they are from the land of eight cities. That's going to come out of tables in this book, which maybe your judge lets you pick, but maybe you roll it up. Um, some other things this brings is um, some of the differences in your uh, in what in, in in things called benizens and dooms which I'll get into those in a bit later also, but think of them as kind of like feats, kind of like edges um, and hindrances, but they're, they're random and you can purchase more of them. And that's what chain makes your character a bit different from a character in a core DCC game. Those, those just don't exist. The one thing this does push you towards though 
And this is maybe one of the, the biggest, most drastic differences that you're gonna find out early in the compendium of secret knowledge is this is gonna share with you that if you wanna run a literary, uh, a literarily, a literarily, a literary, an accurate literary fantasy game of Lankmar, you are gonna play it without fickle gods that interfere in the world uh, through clerics. You're gonna play it without demi-humans. All right, and you're gonna play it without, uh, not demi humans. Yeah, okay. So those two things: no, no gods, no demi humans. That means when you play this game, you're gonna be as a player, a warrior, a wizard, or a thief, and that's it. There's no other classes. And I know some people are thinking is they want all these classes. You have all these splat books. You know, I've been playing Shadow of the Demon Lord. You've got four novice paths. You've got like a billion expert paths. Another billion and. 15 master pads. How do you do a game that has only three classes? And it works. And I'll go into that as we go through this, but Benizens and Dooms help make it work. Plus the fact that alignment for thieves really makes a difference. A chaotic thief and a lawful thief will feel very different. I think, especially if you play them correctly. Uh, and then wizards, uh, the, there's a system called spell stipulations I'll discuss when we go through the, the mechanics that are different. And spell stipulations, we had two wizards in our party for our in-person campaign, and they were totally different characters. You, you could have said they were different classes. They had different spells they were starting out with, and their stipulations were so different from one to the other that they felt so different uh, in builds. So, But you're going to find all that in this book, um, I think spell stipulations is in the judge's guide, but uh, yeah, you get, you know, there's major corruption and minor corruption. They've changed that. Oh, spell stipulations are in here. So uh, we'll be coming back to this book in a second, but this is most of the character information for, for building your character. And then the next, which I'll put that, or uh, put it right here. The next thing is the judge's guide to Naewon, which is a much meatier book. This book has got 104 pages. Definitely a thicker uh, back to it uh, or, or spine to it. This book here uh, really takes you into what the world of Naewon is about. Uh, it takes you into how magic works. It kind of continues off, the, off of the Compendium of Secret Knowledge. It goes through patrons and then it has tables for something called carousing, which is essentially how you regain luck in this game. Because luck works very, very differently in this game compared to core DCC. So, uh, and again, I'll discuss that and we get the differences between the, the two games. So this is your, this is your book for when you're, for, for your few you judges. The next book that's in here oh, is Lankmar City of the Black Toga. And this is all about the city of Lankmar and how to run adventures in the city of Lankmar. And hands down, one of the best city rule books for running urban campaigns that I've ever read. Because it doesn't just read as, this is the market, this is the street, this is, which, this is what's at Eastgate Road, this is what's on Barter Street. This gives you all these random charts and random tables for fun and exciting things that can happen. Interesting events in the Forbidden Temple. So arrival of the gods of Lankmar awake, awakes deep in the bowels of a temple. Arrival of the gods of Lankmar or perhaps a god outcast from their ranks in the days of history, uh, prehistory. Newly awakened enemy seeks to destroy the black boned ones and subject the city to its own mastery. The gods of Lankmar reach out to the heroes of the city demanding they stand with them against the rival. So there's all these random charts in here that could generate more adventures. You don't even need to have adventures with this, uh, like, like, like uh, modules. You can run based on these charts. Random shops in the craft quarter. If you roll uh, 5d10, the market of dreams is what the sharp is called. The owner is Ung. They sell weapons. Uh, the owner is drunk. And it's a front for illegal activities. So if you're trying to do something on the fly really, really fast, you can roll through here to get shop names. Interesting things in Thieves' House. Interesting events in the slums. So like, like, for instance, this is the rich man's quarter. So in the rich man's quarter section, place of interest are listed. Uh, actually, a place of list uh, interest is listed. And then here's interesting things that can happen in the rich man's quarter. 
and then eight curious people to find the rich man's quarter. Every quarter is like that. So your Lankmar is going to be different from another judge's Lankmar. I think it's pretty cool. And that's why I hardly believe that this is, no matter if you play DCC Lankmar, or if you play Savage Worlds Lankmar, or if you play, I don't know, pick a, a, another other AD&D second edition, and you don't touch Lankmar, this book is great for anything urban. All right, it does come with an adventure. You get No Small Crimes in Lankmar, which is also by Michael Curtis. And I don't think it's unfair to say, based on the cover, that this adventure is pretty much like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids for Lankmar. And it's a great starter adventure. It's a, it's a great uh, first level module. For, uh, for for your characters to enjoy. It's, this, you can finish it in one night. Uh, solid three, four hour adventure, a lot of fun. The uh, judges screen that's in here, if you have a DCC screen, I hope you have a DCC screen. The judges screen that's in here changes things up a little bit. Inside you have the carousing table, very important. You have patron guy results, because patrons work a bit different. Languages that are known, how Fleeting Luck works. We'll get into Fleeting Luck in a second. What the quarters of Lankmar are. And then on the outside, a crit table for monsters. Uh, lighting rules. You know, Nawanian restoratives because drinking in this game gets you hit points back. More hit points back since there are no clerics. Uh, air quality table. Some of this reminded me of the old Hackmaster 4th edition tables because I mean, air quality is a little extreme, right? What this is great for, I feel, is if you have two GM screens to have them next to each other. There's some stuff that I wish was... I would have loved another panel that had the critical charts from the old DCC screen to have four panels, but I'm okay with this. I can have two screens out. What, um, I'm now GMing here, and I've been having... When I ran games last week, I had... Uh, Evie and my wife Jennifer, who were players in our in our one game, they sat behind me at the bar. My other players were online. I sat in a lower chair, so my head was like where my chest is now, and that's how I ran. So they could see the screen, and I could look up at the screen, and it worked. But I had to put this. I had two screens out for that. There is uh, a couple gorgeous maps. One is the map of Nawan, which is black and white, and done by Doug Kovacs. So there's Lankmar, right in the middle. There's also the map of Lankmar. And this, I'd stand up, but I'm wearing pajama pants. I don't want to do that. This is an awesome map. This is, uh, you know, a very sturdy, very thick map. Every building is incredible detail. You could make notes on here, maybe. Um, you, could, you could, you know, maybe laminate this and use a, use a dry erase marker. But this is a fantastic map. And uh, I did notice that since, I guess, Creative Liberties, it does not match the map for Savage Worlds. Now, I have two other maps. I have one that's a cloth map that's on my wall that's stretched out. And another, uh, I, think it's, I think it's, I don't think it's vinyl. It's another plastic map or, or paper map that I got that's rolled out. And that came in a, there was a uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics Lankmar map set. I don't know if it's still out there for purchase on their website. But the cloth map is great, and we used command clips to stretch it out on the wall and put it up on the wall. A couple odds and ends. There is a Dungeon Crawl Classics played here, uh, posting for game stores. There is a Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, World Tour 2019 poster. And then finally, there is a special Lankmar edition uh, It costs one gold Rilk. Because golden rilks are the gold rilks are the 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 the, the money of uh, of it's the main currency for for Lankmar. This is a special edition of the Goodman Games Gazette that came in the back. So if you if you if you don't know uh, DCC Lankmar or sorry, all of DCC essentially uh, every so often they will put out a gazette which is like a newspaper. I don't know. I think it's a lot of fun. I like to flip through them and just take a look at what's going on. Uh, there'll be interesting articles written in there. I save all of them, and I really get a kick out of those that that swag. I give a, some of them away if I have duplicates, but not not too terribly often. I, I do like to keep a hold of my of my stuff that I have. 
So that is what is in the box set itself. So let's talk about what the differences are between Core DCC, we'll call it Core DCC, and Lankmar DCC. All right, the first one is the way you start out your game. Most of you who have played Dungeon Crawl Classics have at least once played a DCC funnel. And the funnel is what draws a lot of players into that very first experience. They're at a convention, they hear about people having a good time at this weird game where everyone starts out as three or four peasants that are starting an adventure. They have pitchforks, they have maybe a chicken, they have a loaf of bread, and they descend into the dungeon, and they come out heroic, and then next week they're the wizard and the warrior and the cleric and the thief, or the elf, dwarf, or halfling. That's how DCC starts if you're playing it from a, uh, in your home at home. And maybe, maybe one thing you did is maybe you started it as and Sailors in the Starless Sea, moved on to People in the Pit, and then went to Emerald Enchanter. If you've gotten to DCC when it first came out in 2013, 2014, that might have been the path you took. Or perhaps you are playing it, you're going through and doing the uh, Sunken City Omnibus that, that we played through, and you're playing through several of those adventures and you're leveling up as you go along. That's my longest running DCC campaign used the Sunken City Omnibus, which I might be reviewing as well on the, the show here at some point. DCC Lankmore doesn't go that direction. It doesn't throw fodder out there. You have a backstory, and it's determined probably by your benizens and dooms when you roll those up randomly. That's what you are and who you are is based on some of your roles. And your character has some skill. You are starting out as a warrior, a thief, or a wizard. And you're in the first adventure, a first level adventure, it's called a meet. It is the way the characters get together. It's So you're not saying every character starts up and you all know each other and you're all in a bar. It, it you, you can have a tavern-based adventure, but it's not how... Uh, it's, it's expected that the first adventure starts out with action, kind of like how Ilmet and Lankmar started out. You know, Fafford and the Grey Mouser are both going to rob some thieves... Uh, who belong to the Thieves Guild, and they and they decide to team up together while they're actively robbing the thieves. That is how Ilmet and Lankmar starts. That is how these games should start. When I ran, uh, I started my, my current game with the Madhouse meet. The characters started out as they were all imprisoned together by a wizard, and they had to find their way out of this prison together, and they stuck together afterwards. So the, the big change is how the adventure starts. You are not fodder. Even in the dice rolling, the, the you roll 3d6 in order. You still have that, but you're allowed to flip two of your dice rolls. I let my players have two sets of dice rolls, and they got to pick which one they like most and then flip them because I'm, I, I'm trying to run this. My game's a bit, I don't say more easygoing, but like let the characters have a little more control. About Benizens and Dooms. It is very important because what it what they are is depending on where you're from, when you start out as a character, you roll a a D20 on a Benizen table and a D20 on a Doom table. And each one of these is based on where your character is from. So I'll get a D20 right now and just show you how it works. Let's say your character is from the city of Lankmar. Alright, so we want to know about your character. You're gonna play a warrior. You're you're pretty dead set on this. You wanna be a warrior. And you get a 19. You get martial training as your benison. So you look that up. Your warrior uh, with martial training. I looked up here. Uh, this character is a plus one die bonus to his D die if a warrior. And if not a warrior, you roll a D3 D die when wielding that type of weapon and declare mighty deeds of arms as a warrior. And you can, and you can declare a mighty deed of arms as a warrior. So what that means, for instance, Judge Eby, her character is uh, named Mumania. If you go back a few months, she made her character online. You can watch her make her character in a previous Living for Crits. That character has a, if she uses Genevieve, her sword, um, she gets to roll a D4 instead of a D3 as her deed die. It's always one die step higher for her using her sword. Now what's the doom? So we would know from Evie's character, or this character from Lankmar, they are a master at using their sword, and they have training in the sword. Maybe they've spent their life just mastering the blade, right? 
13 out of Doom, this character is inept. So that's not great. So what does inept mean? This PC was never able to master one aspect of his class and suffers minus one die penalty whenever attempting that ability. It could be a type of weapon, or it could be a thief skill, or it could be a, a certain spell. So what inept would mean is maybe this character spent so much time with the sword, totally can't use bows and arrows. So inept when using a bow, always is a D16 with a bow. And you might say, well, just don't load a bow, dummy. But maybe you have to at some point. You never can use it, or you never want to use it, because you roll a D16. Now, all of these benizens have a luck penalty, have a luck cost to them. Because once you roll your first benizen and roll your first doom, you can pay permanent luck to buy another benizen. But then you have to roll in the doom table again. And it can be bad. You can have a really bad doom. But the fun part about this is that, you know, your martial training uh, Lankmar character, who's from Lankmar, who is inept, is going to be totally different from a, and as a warrior, from another warrior who maybe is uh, owns a ship, and is uh, has a major foe as their as their doom. One's obviously a pirate, and one is more of a master swordsman. So that those kind of tweaks is what makes the characters so different. I mean, that's aside the point of saying that even between the thieves and the warriors, and uh, there's a lot of differences in DCC you might not recognize. Like for instance, everyone sees a high agility warrior and say, a high agility character in DCC and often say, oh, I'm gonna play a thief, why not? Well, you ever thought about playing a a, a, a a range weapon warrior? Have a deed die with a bow attack? Our friend uh, Maggie who plays in our DCC uh, our EJV's DCC game with her friends. I mean, her character in our game has an eight strength as a warrior, but is a master archer with like a seventeen dex, a seventeen agility. So that character right there is a fantastic warrior, but has a bow, and that's the way her character plays. You can do the same thing in here. So I, I've while we've had multiple characters of the same class, it's never felt like having oh, it's three warriors with long swords. This is dull. It does feel different. So that's Benizens and Dooms. And then spell stipulations are, are very similar in their feel. What a spell stipulation is, it's like Mercurial Magic, but I found it to be more interesting and more fun. For instance, um, one of our characters is a wizard in the game. So the game's supposed to be low magic, and, and any magic is going to have some kind of effect on it, some stipulation that has to be, uh, not, not any magic, but a lot of magic uh, is going to have something that's required, like, a, like a, a material component, or you can do something weird. Like the one character in our game to uh, to cast the tech magic has to face north. It was really interesting when they couldn't, they weren't, didn't know which way was north. They had to guess. So if you roll a, a 41 to a 60 on a D100, uh, you don't have any stipulation. But for the most time, you do. Like a spell requires an open flame to be present in order to cast the spell. One of our characters uh, in that campaign needs a bur needs that to cast magic missile. So for them, they have to have a torchlight to cast magic missile. Uh, this spell makes the caster ravenously hungry when cast. Unless he eats, he is cranky and irritable and suffers a minus two penalty to personality until they eat. So if you keep track of this, it stops wizards from casting the same spell over and over again if they have a stipulation that makes it more challenging, like something that takes and does in temporary intelligence loss, or something that, that uh, requires the caster to stand boldly and take a penalty to their AC to cast a spell. Spell stipulations make your characters, your wizard characters, more fun uh, to play because of the challenges they pose on the wizard. At, at least I think they do. And it definitely takes and tones the magic down a bit. Not as crazy as Mercurial Magic, but a really, really fun twist on the wizard class. I found that the wizards, the three wizards I've had experience playing with in this campaign have been more interesting than a lot of the DCC wizards who are just going to max out, you know, they're going to have Magic Missile, uh, they're going to have a few other spells with it, and they're going to Magic Missile nuke everything. Well, imagine if they're Magic Missile at a spell stipulation, if you take a point of intelligence damage temporarily every time you cast it, are you going to nuke everything? Or are you going to be more careful with it? That That's, that's going to be pretty tough. Pretty tough choice. Um, so I covered the meat. I covered spell stipulations and medicines and dooms. 
The literary campaign, like I said, it's just warriors, wizards, and thieves. Luck. Let's discuss fleeting luck. This is our um, our Benny bucket, our luck bucket. Um, I got this for Deadlands a few years ago, or I think it was a year ago, to, to run Deadlands in game stores. And in here, I have all kinds of tokens. I have uh, Savage Worlds Lankmar tokens. I have uh, Savage Worlds Bennies. I have Mojo Chips that I've got for X-Crawl from Brendan LaSalle. And I have Fleeting Luck tokens. So what's Fleeting Luck and why is it important? Fleeting Luck is luck you are giving your players as the game plays as fast as they earn it. They earn it from doing cool things, rolling a critical hit, uh, maybe being super successful doing something. And they get them and they get to add them like their regular luck to rolls. But it's fleeting because whenever someone rolls a one, all the fleeting luck goes away and, and, and the whole table has to turn it in. And that can really suck when you really need your luck. So you don't want to have it build up because you want to spend it because you want to use it before you lose it. And fleeting luck makes the game, the game feel different. But luck in general works differently in, in DCC Lankmar because it runs uh, your, your healing as well. Luck, you can burn luck, you can spend a point of luck uh, in combat to get your healing roll. And you're gonna heal, you know, your hit die when you are, uh, when you're, when you're trying to to get some hit points back in combat. And you might get a little more because there's no there's no magic in this game. If you are down, if you're knocked down below zero hit points, someone can staunch the bleeding in the party, flip you over, and then you you get one hit point back uh, at the end of the, you know, as long as you can you can heal. If you think you spend a point of luck for that too, but um, in combat you can heal. Out of combat, you can take a few turns and heal. If you have certain Nawanian restoratives, like Old Ruspian Old Wine or White Snow Potato Brandy, you get bonuses to your hit die that you're restoring. That's kind of cool. Uh, there's a cost to all those. You might want to have a lot of alcohol with you in the dungeon so you can drink up when you're resting. But uh, you're going to need luck to heal. Well, in DCC... You know, for most characters, with the exception of halflings and thieves, you spend luck, it's gone. So what happens if all your luck is gone and you, you have to heal? Is your permanent luck gone? How much luck should a GM give? Maybe everyone rolled a one, someone rolled a one last round and all the luck's off, the, all the fleeting luck's off the table and now you just have your base luck. Uh, the, the solution to that is carousing. At the end of every adventure or the beginning of, ever, of the next adventure, your GM can choose Everyone's going to roll, everyone can get their luck back. And you get your luck back by rolling on what's called a carousing table. You pick uh, a die to roll from a D3 to a D20, and you roll on a table. And that table tells you uh, how much luck you get back and what happened to your character. So, for instance, let's say I took a lot of, I used a lot of luck. I had 15 luck to start. I'm down to 12, uh, to, to 5 luck. I need 10 luck back. I'm going to roll a d20 on the carousing table at the beginning of the next game. I get an 8. I get to roll 2d4 luck back. That's cool. But for the entire adventure today, I'm mistakenly repeat, uh, I'm repeatedly mistaken for 1. An exiled prince of Ilthmar. Great. So that comes up in play, and now the judge has to work that into the game. Okay, James's character is mistaken for a prince. What's that going to mean? Interesting I rolled this because um, during our our first adventure, our one player Cody rolled that he'd be mistaken in the next adventure for a enemy general. And I made him look like this Mingle general and I had and he was very persuasive to these Mingles and now they think he is their general and our last campaign was our adventure was based around his character's carousing results. We wrote a whole adventure about freeing Mingle slaves because they all think he's the general now. And he's calling himself the general. Maybe the real general will show up at some point, but that all came from this carousing table. And a whole adventure uh, came out of that. That's pretty cool. I know that there's a lot of cool adventure prompt material out there to, to spark adventure. But you know what? Every time my wife's character, because her character is always broke, she always seems to roll like something like you awaken with a legendary hangover, minus one dice to all actions until you have more to drink. 
oh, you're also broke. She loses all her money all the time. So, I'm here. Oh, so uh, that story totally justifies the whole product. That's awesome. Glad to hear that. I mean, I don't get anything for this, but like, you know, I just have to just share the love, right? Um, anyway, I love that table because it is a system to get uh, more, to get your luck back for any character. So you're not losing it forever. So it means players are going to spend it. It means that you're going to have experiences where players spend point after point of luck to do awesome stuff, knowing they have a chance to get it back. And that chance to get it back is going to lead to more fun stories later. I saw a post or I remember talking uh, or hearing uh, Jen Brinkman, who was the editor on this pro product and did a fantastic job. Uh, Jen was, I think, saying that the carousing tables alone can just create your adventures, create all your adventures. And it's totally true. I, I figure that a good, our next adventure we're running is going to be called, uh, I think it's called uh, Cheating Death. And I expect that between that adventure and the one after that, it'll be just whatever the carousing tables came up with. So, I mean, it's, that's, that's a really fun way to restore, um, you know, restore a stat pool. It's not just, oh, you get your luck back roll, but you have to make a commitment and there's gonna be a penalty. And nothing is great on the list. Nothing's, there, if you roll really low, you don't get much luck back, but nothing, nothing really happens. But if you roll really high, the, the, you roll at 14, for instance. The morning you awoke, this morning you awoke naked, and it says where? Maybe atop a cult sacrificial altar, um, in the public stocks, in the bed of a minor lord or lady. Uh, you've escaped, but all your wealth was lost in the misadventure. Your equipment was sold to a pawnbroker who will happily part with the items for three times their true worth. Get that back. I mean... That's, that's that's an adventure in and of itself. That could be the first two hours of that day. There's really unlimited adventure in Lankmar and there's so many combinations and there's so much goodness in there that you can experience without uh, you know going that far down the into into buying all kinds of adventures unless you want to. What's the range of luck you can return? It depends. So what essentially happens, is uh, you roll a one to a, a one a d three to a d twenty. You pick which die you want to roll, and I'll hold this up to the screen. Let me get it here. So, let's say you roll a four. If you roll a four, you get to roll a d six luck back. But the downside is you were apprehended by the watch for public drunkenness. You escape, but you lost all your stuff and your wealth. There's a lot of you lost all your stuff. I will say that, and you are trying to go get your stuff back. You know, maybe you're doing a job for the city guard to get it back. Maybe you're having to bribe someone to get it back. So your 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 roll, so if you roll a D3, uh, if you choose for a D3, you're gonna get within a D3 to a D5 of luck back, which might end up with you being broke or miraculously, boringly, you begin the adventure unscathed or maybe you uh, awaken, discover you have a, a suitor. That could be interesting. So and that's called carousing. It is one of the most fun things in there. And I would say carousing could be utilized in so many great ways. That carousing table would fit in any DCC campaign, especially if you were trying to get your players to use more luck. It does not give you any fleeting luck and fleeting luck does go away between adventures, but it does give you a way to restore a stat that you know, can be drained. Who wants to be playing a character who has three luck left in a long-term campaign? I mean, even in core DCC, that's one of those things that if your GM isn't giving out luck occasionally in the game, uh, it can really hurt your character's long-term chances of survival. Not to say you can't make it, but it can be a challenge. Um, I think I covered everything. All the main differences from core DCC I've covered and you know, kind of wrap things up. And if there's any other questions, there's a couple of folks watching, I'm happy to answer them uh, before I wrap things up. But I give this game an A+, plus, a 10 out of 10, the, the highest grade possible. DCC Lankmar is, is at this point becoming quickly my favorite DCC product that has been produced outside of the core rule book, which is pretty, given how much I love the Purple Planet, which I, I love the Purple Planet, 
DCC Lankmar changes the game in a way that, for someone who's been playing Dungeon Crawl Classics for almost six years, makes the game very fresh and new and nuanced. It, it makes the game something different. Even though I still love playing core DCC, I just I love that as well. But this makes it a different game. I would I don't run as Gonzo a campaign with the, this game. I run this game grittier, but still you know heroic. The city is you know urban. It's just a, a, a central campaign in a city, but it still feels vast. It, it is literally the, the quintessential city campaign. Uh, oh, question. Uh, Core ninety six says after I got the PDFs. It's wound its way into my, all my campaigns, especially the all those tools. And that is, I was going to say like who this book is for or who the PDFs are for, and you you definitely hit it there. Um, there is so much to pull from in this box set that whether or not you plan on running the game in its literary style as I have with the three classes and no demi-humans in the city of Lankmar or its surroundings, or if you just want to, this, to place this city somewhere in a more traditional fantasy world, like when I was running the Purple Sorcerer's Sunken City omnibus, there's this great city that the Sunken City's next to. I, I could have used Lankmar for that. Um, wherever you're putting it, there's stuff in this box. You could use all the city rules and all of the materials in here in another city, whether it's Punjar or whether it's... Uh, uh, Greg Greg's on and says, isn't, isn't it Thursday? Yes, Greg, if you watch the beginning of this, uh, I'm doing Thursday reviews now for games. Woo! So every Thursday we're going to do this on top of Sundays. No Judge Evie, though. Uh, not that she can't join us. She just doesn't do book reports. Uh, anyway, you could use the, all of the city material for DCC Lankmar in any city-based campaign. If you play, you know, a, a different... Uh, campaign uh, or a, a different uh what's it called i'm losing my words here if you play a different system you can use a lot of these materials let's say you're running it in the city of sigil for planescape you could use these tables for sigil it would work fine um you could use all of the mechanics of fleeting luck and benizens and dooms and carousing and luck based healing to do a more uh, low magic sword and sorcery campaign let's say you wanted to run conan the barbarian I mean, priests and clerics and Conan the Barbarian, I mean, maybe you have clerics there, but you don't have demi-humans. You don't have elves and dwarves and stuff. So maybe you want to bring Fleeting Luck over to Conan the Barbarian and bring Benizens and Dooms there, reskin a few of them, have carousing, and now you're running a game, you know, in, um, in, 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 in the Conan stories, the Robert E. Howard Conan stories. So you could use it for that. And if you just don't use the Lankmar setting itself, there's a lot of materials in there to use. So this is truly a product that every gamer should have on their shelf. And that is why I chose it for my first Thursday night review. So to wrap, if you enjoyed this review, uh, let me know. And uh, like, comment, and subscribe it's on YouTube. If you are watching this through Twitch, we would love you to spread the word about the channel. If you are just watching us for the first time tonight or when you're watching this video, Judge Evie and I, my 13-year-old uh, daughter, we do a weekly show on here called Living for Crits every Sunday night at 9 p.m. We'll be doing a show this Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. So we're still here. You're still going to see us on Sundays. But every Thursday, my plan right now is to do a review right here on Twitch and then I'll share it over on YouTube and I'll be covering other products. I'm not sure what I'm going to cover next week. I have a few ideas that we're going to talk about. And it probably won't be quite as long as this one. Because I covered a giant box set today. But I'm going to cover. My plan is to cover different DCC modules I've run. Or been a player for and enjoyed. Some of the source books and whatnot for that. I might dabble outside of DCC. You might see some Shadow of the Demon Lord thrown in here at some point, or maybe a classic Cypher System product that I enjoy, or anything else on my shelf. I might go back into, and talk about some of the stuff that I love from my AD&D 2nd Edition days I still own. I still own all my old Ravenloft and Dragon, uh, Dark Sun stuff. Um, so, yeah, this is that's the plan. Lone Jedi says, uh, nice new feature. I dig it. We'll be back for more. And our stock does says Purple Planet and Shadow of the Demon Lord. I did do a Shadow of the Demon Lord review. Reese, that, I think that was a month or two months ago. So 
I think you can go back and on Living for Crits, I cover that one Sunday that Judge Evie could not be on. I did a, a discussion of Shadow the Demon Lord. Purple Planet, I think, definitely needs a review. Uh, so, and another request for Shadow the Demon Lord or Tower of the Black Pearl. That is a great module, which I have run multiple times. So I would definitely consider that. Not the longest module, but one of the best modules for running in one session, in like one sitting. Uh, I think Tower of the Black Pearl is such a wonderful adventure if you've got three hours and you want to have a game going. And four hours, you can, you can finish it in three to four hours easily. Uh, or a little longer if you want to have the players really experience everything there or you want to flesh some of it out. Or enjoy the experience of getting to the, uh, the tower. But if you're watching us on YouTube and you have something that you want to suggest, you know, go ahead and uh, put that in the comments below and we will, we will get to that. So that's it. That's the show. I'm glad you uh, all had a chance to come join me and I will see you on Sunday with Judge Evie. So for now, have a great night. Happy gaming. Take it easy.